Well, if you guys haven't signed in, you guys can do that on a break. So why don't we go ahead and bring it in and let's have a seat and we're going to get started. <laughs> Well, it's good to see all of your beautiful faces this morning. Yay! I hope everyone is wide awake and excited to be alive. My guess is that many of you are tired because uh, it's Saturday morning and you have a long week. Or you were here watching a movie uh, last night until 10 o'clock and you're tired. I don't know, whatever it is. But uh, I'm thankful that you're here. And uh, I want to just encourage you this morning to make sure that you... Uh, take the time to get to know one another. We were actually going to assign seats today, and uh, we decided to wait on that. That will probably happen when you come in uh, for some future sessions, and uh, we'll utilize that not to be mean to you, but we will utilize that to um, help make sure that you are working in diverse groups as opposed to just sitting next to people that you know. And so, uh, but we thought we would give you at least one more week to try and, you know, uh, build those relationships on your own and, and not get too freaked out. So that, that will probably happen at some point, but we're not going to do it today. Although we still have numbers on your table. We were that close to getting it done and decided not to at the last minute. And so, uh, but we might still use those table numbers for something. We'll just have to see. So I want to pray and get us started. And then we're going to start with a little group work. Uh, at your tables for just a couple of minutes and um, and then we're going to work through this and we'll be done at 1130 today and uh, hopefully you will um, grow from this what we're trying to do you know of course what we're trying to do is help to create leaders and that's you and uh, we have people at various points in their life in this leadership journey but um, my hope and my prayer is that you will thrive in this that you will grow in these times. Uh, you'll grow closer to God, ultimately, because any kind of leadership uh, really needs to be dependent on Christ. And we want Him as our model. And so, ho hopefully, that's, at the very least, that's what we're shooting for. Uh, you know, as I've told you and what we talked about last time, that the end result of this training over the, you know, once a month for, for almost a year, will be that some of you will be just better leaders in your home. Some will be better leaders in your workplace. Some will be better leaders for uh, growing your children up. And some will be better leaders here at this church or other churches if you move away someday. Uh, or that you will be a leader here in helping to lead groups of people and shepherd people. And so there's lots of different outcomes of this. and. We know that God knows what the answer is. We are waiting for him to show us, but that's what this part of what this training is about. So I'm really thankful you're here. So let's pray and we'll get started. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the gift of life, the gift of breath, the gift of sunshine, the gift of a building that we can come and meet in. We're, we praise you for being who you are. You are good and awesome. You know everything. And your ways and your thoughts are higher and better than our own. We praise you for your word. We praise you for the Bible that gives us a foundation that never changes. And we can look at it and grow and know who you are as you have revealed yourself to us. We pray your Holy Spirit will move in and through this place. That it will open our eyes and open our hearts to know and to understand and to experience you in a deeper way. Lead us, Father. Grow us. Help us to build relationships today that will last a lifetime because what we do here is just a taste of what we will see for eternity. Help us to love this time and enjoy this time. In Jesus' name, amen. If I could get someone to go shut that door, that would be awesome. And if, uh, someone in the sound booth, uh, could you turn me down just a little bit? It seems a little loud to me. All right, so... Here's what we're going to do. You've got just a few minutes in your groups, and I want you to do, that's a little too much, maybe just a little more. There we go. That's great. Um, what I'd like for you to discuss in your groups is this first question, which is, what is communion? Now, your assignment from last time was 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting around verse 23. So here's what I want you to do. 
Grab your Bible, open those up, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 through 26. And what we're doing is we're concluding what we didn't finish last time. And so we know that Christ died to set us free from sin. Everybody understands that, right? And so part of how we celebrate that as a gift is what is talked about in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. So you've got like three or four minutes. You don't have long. I want you to just quickly outline what you see in there as an answer to what is communion. So if someone asked you, what is communion? You would use 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26 to answer that question. So you've got a couple minutes. Talk about it in your group. Okay. All right. So what I need are quick answers. So let's answer this question then. Uh, what is communion? Give me a real short answer with the verse that proves why you think that. Come on, people. Leadership training. Verse 24. Okay, go ahead. That's right. We are remembering his crucifixion. Absolutely. That is part of it. What else? Good job. What else? Verse 26. It's remembering remembrance till Jesus returns. In okay. verse 26 it says, Proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Very good. Excellent. It's a proclamation. Remembering him until he comes. Again, Jesus is coming back. If you're not familiar with that, we'll talk about that later. So that's good. <laughs> Uh, yes. No. <laughs> what do you need to say? Real quick. Oh, we were just going to say about being self-prepared. Well, we're going to talk about that next. Yes. Um, in verse 25, he says it's the new covenant. Yes. And so because prior to that, we couldn't um, communicate with God by ourselves. But now because of what Jesus did on the cross, we can go directly to God. Excellent. Very good. It opens up the door. It's a new covenant. allows us access to God through Jesus. Good. What else? We're missing just at least one more. It's a really simple one. I would say verse 23. So here's, what I, here's how I have outlined this. You guys did a great job, by the way. Really good. First, it's a meal. Verse 23. It's table fellowship, which was a big deal. If you look through the stories of Jesus, one of the things religious leaders gave him a hard time with was that he would eat with sinners. He would eat with people that were non-desirables. Um, there's part of that table fellowship. Why could he do that? Well, because of what he was about to do. Why can we do that? It's because of what Christ has done. And he set that stage to allow us to come together to celebrate what he's doing. So, but it's a meal. Number two, it's a reminder or a memorial, verse 24. It's a promise, verse 25. And it's a proclamation, verse 26. So that's good. All right, so the second question then, and I'm going to give you about four or five minutes to handle this. There's actually two. So verses 25 through 29, still on communion then. Verses 25 through 29, two questions. What attitude should you bring to communion? And what does it do? So what attitude should you bring? And what does communion do? 25 through 29, go ahead and discuss it for a few minutes. Okay. All right. So, what attitude do you bring? Hey, guys, hang in there with me. What attitude do you bring to communion uh, and prove it with Scripture? What attitude should you have? Yeah. Um, well, your attitude should probably be humbleness, thankfulness, reverence, um, respectful, and obviously happy or joyful. Um, and... Where do I get that? I mean, here it says uh, uh, in verse 27, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy way will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. So a man should examine himself in this way. He should eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Uh, that goes in verse 28. And, of course, it goes on and tells you, uh, For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body, eats and drinks just on himself. If, you, if, if you're not sincere, very are sincerely grasping the hold of what it is that God has done through Jesus Christ. 
to uh, obviously then allow you to have the Holy Spirit in you and those that you, you know, recognize that and have that kind of feeling. Obviously, at that point, you know, not recognizing the body, you'll drink judgment for yourself. Okay, good. So verse 28, self-examination. That's the, the short answer. That's good. We need to examine ourselves before we take communion. Verse 28. All right, what else? What other attitude do we bring? What, what do we need to have? In our heart, what what needs to be there from these verses, 25 through 29? What else should we be doing leading up to communion or at communion? She says a good one. Oh yeah. I'm going to know. Pretty simple. She has a good one. All right. Anybody? What should you do before taking communion based on verses 25 to 29? Examine your heart. Prepare Examine your heart. Okay. Verse 28. Good. What else? How about confess your sins? Do you see that in verse 27? Verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. So we want to make sure that part of this is that we're seeking forgiveness from God for the things that we've done. Now, uh, one of the questions that has come up um, and comes up pretty often is, well, what if an unbeliever comes up and takes communion? Uh, you know, and that's a big question in a church that has an open distribution model, which means you can just come take it yourself. What if this scoundrel, terrible person, which is every one of us without the blood of Christ, but what if they come up and they take it in an unworthy manner? An unbeliever. What if an unbeliever comes and takes communion? Uh, shouldn't you stop that? Well, first of all, we don't know what's in the heart of each individual person. But here's ultimately the issue. If an unbeliever takes communion, and the fear is, verse 27, well, they, if they do it in an unworthy manner, they're guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Well, here's the deal. If an unbeliever takes communion, they're condemned already. And it doesn't really matter because they're already guilty of sinning against the Lord because they're an unbeliever. Does that make sense? This is one reason that we don't pick and choose who we're going to let take communion. This is between that individual person and God. But for those of us that know him, we need to be seeking forgiveness for the things that we've done wrong as we come to the table. Verse 29 is a recommitment of who we are and what we believe. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment to himself. That's part of what this whole thing is that we're talking about. And so a good place is, let's make a recommitment to who he is. That we believe in what Jesus did and we know who we are. Uh, verse 26 is about restoring relationships. For whenever you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Uh, we need to restore relationships. We need to make sure that we're focused on the right thing. You know, Matthew chapter 5 talks about, you know, if you come um, to give your gift at the altar and you realize that you, you know, sinned against someone, you should, you should stop and go and seek forgiveness and then come back, that kind of thing, and to make sure that we're restoring relationships. And that's part of what it does. And what Christ does is restore these relationships uh, with us, restores the relationship through the cross. So that's part of what the attitude is that we bring to communion. That's what it does. Now, here's the thing. Why do we do it every week? Because that's going to be one of the questions that will come up. Uh, we don't have to do it every week. Now, I think we, we do it, in my mind, we do it every week for a couple of reasons. One is we could do it right now if we wanted to. Uh, we could do it every day if we wanted to. Is it important to remember the body and the blood? Yes, absolutely. We already talked about that. What is it for? Why do we do it? Can you ever proclaim the Lord's death until he comes too much? The answer is no. Is there ever a time that we would not want to remember the body and the blood of Jesus? Is there ever a time we would not want to do that? No. Is there ever a time we could do that too much to remember the body and blood of the Lord? No. In fact, we would hope that as a Christian, you live every day and every moment with that as a reality. Every decision gets made in light of the cross. So in one sense, we're communing with Christ constantly as we pray continually and rejoice always, and we remember what he's done. But we do it corporately um, because of a cue that we get from the New Testament, and one of those would be from Acts chapter 2. And so you've heard me say this a million times probably, but verses 42 through 46, or maybe 47, but listen, verse 42 of 242. 
They were continually <coughs> devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. I'm confident part of the meal was a communal type meal where they're breaking bread, mainly because of the language uh, that Jesus uses that on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. This is, in, this is, a, this is a verbal cue that tells us this is probably communion also, okay? Based on other contexts from Scripture, because the Bible is the best definer of itself. And so if we're confused about a passage, do we see other places where breaking bread is used, and can we get a clue of what that might mean? Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. Verse 44, And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. They began selling their property and possessions, were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continue, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. So we see something interesting. They're breaking bread from house to house and they were taking their meals. Does everybody catch that clue in there? And so day by day, they, they were doing this. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals uh, together. And so this is why we do this corporately all the time. Now, are you forced to take communion every week? The answer is no. And in fact, if your heart's not right, verses 25 through 29 tell you you shouldn't. Does that make sense? If you are in a poopy mood and you want to kill everybody, it's probably not the right time to come up and take communion. You probably need to sit there, go to God in prayer, seek forgiveness, confess your sins, Give over your frustrations to him that you have with someone else, um, but examine your heart. That should be the right attitude as you come to the table. Now, um, does that mean if you if you don't take it on a Sunday morning, you're going to hell? I, no, no. Uh, does that mean that you could take communion later in the service if you wanted to? Like if you finally get it together and by the end you're ready to go and you want to do that as a proclamation of God's um, forgiveness over whatever you came with the poopy attitude about, sure, that would be great. Uh, but we want to examine ourselves and make sure we understand the gravity of this and we don't want to drink, eat and drink condemnation to ourselves. Evaluate your heart. Check your heart. Make sure you're in the right place. And if you're a in the camp that says I don't want to take it all that often because it loses significance don't does that make sense uh, now I will tell you a personal bias and that is and because I've heard it uh, for a long time well if you take communion every week it will lose its significance I don't believe that is true because we sing every week we pray every week I preach every week we come here every week and none of those lose significance so I'm not sure why communion would um, but that's okay. So that's just one of those mindset things. We Again, for me, as a non-denominational Bible thumper, <laughs> which is I want to believe what this says, I want to look and take my cues from Scripture, and that's where I, that's why we did this exercise. Yeah? You know, you, you thought one of the blues, blues and wouldn't that be because we're not approaching each time with that holy matter and preparing ourselves for it? We were talking about like someone that grew up doing it every Sunday, it became very ritualistic. Mm -hmm. Is that you forgot the preparing aspect? It was like, right. oh, this is the part of service, pass yeah. the tray, do your thing, and move it on. And you're not right. having that time, which you do on Sundays, and you tell us to remember, you tell us to focus, yeah. and, and get with other ones. And so maybe it becomes, it loses its you know, its power when we're not focusing like we should, like the scripture tells us to. I don't think that right. right. Yeah, I think so. And I've been to churches before where, you know, they were taking communion and maybe it was an every week thing. And and, uh, and it pretty much went something like this. This is the time in our service where we remember the body and blood of our Lord and Savior. Let's pray. <laughs> Dear God, please bless this bread as we eat it. Dear bless this cup as we drink it. Thanks for doing what you did on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. You went to church with me, didn't you? <laughs> uh, and, and, that, and what happens is that same message is over and over and over. It would be like me preaching the same sermon every week. And that can lose significance if people's minds aren't drawn to something that's important. And so that's why we don't do it that way. Now, I will tell you, as part of 
one of the things that we will do in time, if you are so inclined, we will begin allowing others and asking others to come and, and share that message because it's new and it's fresh when you do that to make sure not that we're making up new stuff because the scriptures are the scriptures, but to have perspective. And what does this mean? I mean, one of the most beautiful things ever, like on Monday nights, is to have someone stand up and go, you know, this is what this means to me. And this is why it's important. And this is what it's done in my life because of the cross. Those are great stories to tell. We want to do that. We want to do that. Uh, the only other thing, now I, I talked about the, and I'm giving you this because people are going to ask you the questions. And part of what we talked about last time is making sure that we have unity in how we communicate. That doesn't mean we have uniformity. We may still have people in the room that don't buy it that you should do it every week. Uh, now, part again, one of the things I didn't say was part of one reason we do it every week also is to make sure that no matter who walks through our doors, they hear this message, Christ died for you. And communion is the best way to do that, in my opinion. And so no matter what, when I get to heaven and God says, you know that weekend that you were preaching on marriage, you didn't mention Jesus once. And you had people that were there one time and they didn't hear the message of the cross. I don't want to hear that. Now, that's not a guilt thing. It just says that the message of the cross is essential to everything else. In fact, Paul says, if it weren't for the cross and the resurrection, we're wasting our time. So we make that important part of what we communicate. Make sense, everybody? All right. So anyway, so uh, as, as you go through this, hopefully what happens is we have unity of thought here. That This is why we do this. Maybe you don't want to do that every week, but at least we have unity of thought. That we don't have to have uniformity, but we have unity. We understand this is why we do this. Okay, so let's talk. We're going to totally jump and switch gears now. Uh, by the way, let me ask this question. Was this useful exercise to just spend a little bit of time digging through 1 Corinthians 11? Was it helpful? I hope it was. Keep digging. Keep reading through it. That's one of those passages you get through, you know, uh, 23 or so through 29, and you just read it over and over and over again. Or read Acts chapter 2 over and over and over again. Or go to Acts chapter 5 at the very end and read it over and over and over again. That's one of those things that when you read things several times, things begin to jump off the page at you that you may have read 10 times already. Or 100 times. Has anyone, did anyone have that experience with the 1 Corinthians 11 study? You've read that before. You knew what it meant. But in digging deeper, you saw things today even you haven't seen before. Anybody? I saw things I've heard about. Right. Can you raise your hands again? I'm just curious. How, something new? Wow, that's amazing to me. That gave me goosebumps. That people saw things that they've never seen before when they just did this little bit of time. 10, 15 minutes. That's awesome. All right. God, thank you for that. That blows my mind. Thank you for giving us your word that we can open up. And it is new still to us. That it still teaches us something. Something that we could have read a hundred times. It's alive and active and moving. Thank you in Jesus' name. So practical living uh, for Christ. So I'm, I need some help. Um, I probably have enough of these, but here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Uh, if I can get some helpers to come up and grab these for me. Now, here's the deal, guys. Don't cheat. Don't sit there and read through all these. I'm going to go through these for a little bit. Um, and... Um, I don't want you to get sidetracked by reading through it and not hear what I'm saying. Because as good of a multitasker as all of you are, I'm sure, it's hard to read something and listen to something different at the same time. So don't get hung up on reading these. But I want to work through these for just a, a few minutes, okay? Okay. Okay, while they're passing those out, uh, someone texted me a question, although I'm worried uh, about saying that because now I'm going to get like 
65 different text messages asking questions. Uh, so don't text me. Um, but I'm just kidding. It was my wife, so I have to uh, pay attention. So here's the question. What about children taking communion? Listen, guys, I need everybody's attention, please. Uh, what about children taking communion? Um, let me say two other things about communion. One is, on the road to Emmaus, and, and I don't want to talk about it too much, and I've talked about it several times here. Um, on the road to Emmaus, there's, you know, Jesus has been resurrected, and he's walking along the road with these two guys, and they have no idea it's Jesus. Jesus apparently is able to mask or, you know, or veil who he is. We see this actually in one of the Gospels, too, where they think he's the gardener. The resurrected Jesus that Mary doesn't recognize him. And so these guys that are walking with Jesus, they don't recognize who he is. But they're talking about everything that had just gone on. And Jesus is sort of playing dumb. He's like, well, what's going on? They're like, are you the only one in Jerusalem that has not been paying attention? What is your deal, dude? I mean, you know, this is the flavor of the conversation. And they're telling Jesus the story of Jesus and what just went down the cross. And they don't realize it's Jesus. And he gets there and he's, Jesus is going to go on. And no, no, let's eat together. And in the midst of a meal with Jesus, their eyes are open to him. And my hope and prayer is that for those that do not know Christ, that when they sit here on a Sunday morning or on a Monday night, that their eyes will be opened when they sit at the table with Jesus. Honestly, that's the most amazing thing. That's my hope, that eyes will be open to who Jesus really is in those moments. It's important. So what about children? Now, children, this could be a debate, and I don't have time for it right now. We could talk about it on a break if you want to. So I'll give you my short answer, and if you want to talk to me about it, you can. So children um, have always been a big debate on whether or not children should be allowed to take communion or whatnot. Uh, first of all, I think children... Um, and this is going to get into a bigger conversation I can't have right now because of time. The children um, do not, uh, are not at risk of losing their salvation when they're children before they're able to comprehend the difference between right and wrong. And so, um, so it's for adults who have willingly sinned against the Lord. We're the ones that are in danger of the judgment. I don't think children are. In those moments. And so um, if a child feels compelled and desires to take the body and the blood, I think it is the parent's job to teach them to let them know this is what this means. We're not getting a snack at church. This is what this means. We are remembering Jesus. And it's a great teaching moment to teach your children. But you need to teach them so the kids don't just think, hey, I want to go to church so I can get some grape juice. And a cracker or what you know we don't want that to be the mindset because as they grow we want that them to grow in that faith in christ and hear that story over and over because there is no other story that's more important than that story you have got to teach this to your children when you rise up when you lay down write it on your doorposts tie it to your you know forehead or whatever you know you've got to have this message that christ died for them to set them free and so for me, it does not bother me if a child has been trained that way because we want them to understand what that is and to celebrate that gift. And as children, without, without having that sinfulness in them that is risking their salvation, I don't have a problem there. Um, so that's my answer for that. Anyone want to give me the alternate view? Because I know the alternate view, which is they shouldn't. Here's the deal. If it goes against your conscience for your children to do it, don't let them do it. You're the parent. You can decide that. Does that make sense? And you would tell them, I don't think you're ready because this means you have committed your life to Christ. And when you get there, then we can do that. If you want to do that, that's fine with me. Um, but that's my that's my take. And we can disagree there, but that's my take on it. Anyone else? Anyone want to respond to that? You're welcome to. You can totally flat out disagree with me if you want. Uh, and I'll, I can handle it, I promise. I won't even debate you on it. Say whatever you want. Anybody? Well, I might say something to that. Yeah. I think it might be good to communicate that actually every so often on Sunday morning. You know, yeah. really, this is what I feel about it. This is why. Yeah. And uh, I think it'd be good clarity for many of us because many of us come from different backgrounds. Right. And uh, you know, to us personally, 
it's something that didn't take place in right. the church that I grew up in because it was something that you would do once you committed your life to Christ. Right. So in some ways, from that background, it's like, well, this kind of, I don't want to say cheapens it, but it doesn't seem like it's, it's as authentic because it's supposed to be a personal thing between you and your Savior. Right. Well, this three-year-old truly can't know what no. you know, a Savior is. No. So I think it's good maybe to have communication on it. Right. Um, I think it'd be good to talk, talk yeah. about that. And, and I, I don't think I would have a three-year-old either. I think right. it's one of those moments that if you can teach your children and they're getting it and they're understanding it, um, that's good teaching. You know, but it, it needs to be taught. It can't just be, here's your snack, shut up. You know, it, it needs to be something that we're teaching them and going through. Now, we don't take communion to the kids' classes because if because we don't feel like that's a necessity to do in the kids' classes. Um, that's what the family does when you worship together. If the kids are in here, that's something you can, you can decide. But I agree, Travis. I think it's not just, you know, we don't just shove it in their mouth so that they get into the habit of doing it. Instead, it's a moment, an opportunity to teach them and to show them this is why we do this. If they can't comprehend why at all, it probably doesn't make sense. Make sense? Yeah. I think on that thought, you know, pull back to whether or not we should judge if somebody's been saved or not saved and taking communion, that's not for us, because that's between them and God. But I know for my child, if, if, if he's accepted Christ, I mean, you know, that's a pretty good starting point to say, well, I think he's pretty mature enough to do this. So. Yeah, and I think that's great. I really do. I think it's a good a good place if the, if the child has said, I believe. With us and our family, we our kids waited to take communion until... They could articulate and say, I believe that Jesus is the son of God and he died for me. And, and so I think that's a fair place to go. Um, so I, I don't think all of a sudden that makes freedom that, oh, now my five-year-old can take communion because I thought he couldn't. It's really not that. It, you need to know your children and you need to lead your kids and make sure that they understand what they're doing. Because it is a serious thing. It is an important thing. And it shouldn't be taken lightly. You need to explain it. Um, to the kids, but um, that anyway. What else was there? Some another hand. I was I saw? just going to ask if there's any reference to whether they were what they were doing it with the kids in, in the Bible. I don't see anything either way, <coughs> and that's where I think there's freedom there. I, I don't see. I mean, these people were me. They probably didn't have kid care like we have right. back then, <laughs> um, and so you know, um, these are Pete, like in Acts chapter two. They're together. All these people are saved, and they're continually doing these things. And you go through, they're living their life together. This is doing life together. It doesn't say. It just doesn't say. So. The other thing is that, we, you know, we we let our little, kid, our little kids see us worship. They come to worship with us sometimes. They sit in the worship with us. They sing. They raise their hands. They don't really necessarily understand why they're doing it. Um, I'm talking about my three-year-old right yeah. second. Um, and this just occurred to me, but wouldn't taking the Lord's Supper and teaching them along the way every time a little bit more about why we do that, wouldn't that sort of fall in the same category? Yeah, I mean, I think it does, yes. And I think it is something that we need to be teaching our kids all the time, but not just on Sunday. Oh, yeah. I think these are conversations you guys should be having around the dinner table, personally. Right. Because if you train up the child the way they should go... When they're old, they won't depart from it. Now, it's a proverb, so it's not a definitive promise. But the general rule, which is what a proverb is, says that if we were, are going to train up our children, which is not Sunday school's responsibility, that's just a bonus. It's really in your homes, training up the children the way they should go um, all the time. Communion should be a conversation you guys could have on Tuesday or Thursday at, t at dinner, and that this is a normal thing. Um, I, I think that's where 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 it comes down to. Anything else? Okay. If you, here's the deal. That's one of those weird topics because the church that we have here is come, everybody comes from all different backgrounds. If I just freaked your business out, do not leave Renew <laughs> because you, but you need to talk to me about it for real. Does that make sense? That's for this topic and any topic. If you just totally had your theological mind blown, Please just call me, and we'll talk through it, okay? Is everybody okay there? All right. So, practical living for Christ. Now, one of the things that I have taught from a couple of times, uh, and we've made available, are what we call the decisions that define us. Now, these originally came from um, a book 
that uh, we took his ideas and it was intended to do that. These, you know, sort of decisions that we've made along the way uh, that help define who we are. And we took his decisions and we made them better and we threw out his stupid ones. <laughs> you can laugh, it's okay. Uh, and so, uh, but we took these and we boiled them down to be able to understand sort of in sound bites who we are. Now, these are not creeds. These are not creedal statements. These are ways for us to be able to comprehend big ideas together. Uh, I love teaching from axioms. An axiom is just a short idea that when you say it after good teaching, everyone knows what that means. And so like if I were to say salvation hangs in the balance, everyone in here has heard me say that before, guaranteed. I say it a lot. Why? Because it's an axiom that's important. Tattoos welcome is an axiom. Everyone knows what that means. And you could explain why we would say that. And so it's a one idea, one sentence, one word, a few words, a phrase, whatever it is, that says a lot without saying a lot. And so what happens when you begin to really vision cast with anyone and you say one thing, then everyone goes, ah, I know what he's talking about. And you don't have to re-preach the same sermon all the time. Hospital for the soul sick. Everyone knows what that means. And so these are kind of like our axioms that help us to understand who we are. Now, what you'll find, depending on how this got handed out to you, on one side you have this nice clean bullet point, we've decided, we've decided. On the back side are the scriptures that back up why we've said what we've said. We haven't made these things up. These are scriptural ideas. That as we go through the Bible and understand, because why? The Bible is our authority, only the Bible. Nothing you think is authority if it goes against the Bible. The Bible is always our foundation. The Bible is always the place we come back to with questions. Is it fair to say, well, this is what I think about something? Absolutely, as long as what you think about it doesn't contradict the Bible. If it contradicts the Bible, you are not right. You are wrong. Well said. Okay. But if what you think about it if it's in an area where there's freedom, okay, as long as you've done a good job of being a good Bible student, you understand the, the scriptures themselves to make sure this is in alignment with Christ. This is in alignment with who God is. Because there's stuff that's not referenced in scripture that you can make up all kinds of goofball things. Uh, and that doesn't mean that it's, there's always freedom there. You have to know the heart of God and who he is. And the canon of scripture is our authority to do that. And we can get a big picture of who God is in some areas, and we still have to make sure that our opinions and ideas are in alignment with that. When it's my opinion, when I'm preaching, I will tell you. This is what I think. I can't prove it from Scripture. I've said some funny things in the past, like in my sanctified imagination. This is what I could see it. Like, for instance, Peter, when he gets out of the boat, it doesn't tell us what happens to the other eleven. It's about Peter getting out of the boat, the faith to put that leg up over the edge and stand on that water. Then he takes his eyes off Jesus. If you read the story, he takes his eyes off Jesus and he focuses on the storm. Now to preach, right? I mean, we've all been there. We take our eyes off Jesus. We focus on the storm. What happens? He begins to sink. He cries out for Jesus to save him. Oh, good message right there. And Jesus does and snatches him out. But always it's one of those, what are the other 11 doing? And my joke always is the other 11 were in the boat peeing themselves because of the storm, you know? Uh, now, I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us what's going on in their hearts or their minds, but in my sanctified imagination, I can imagine those 11 are freaking out, especially when Peter <laughs> throws his leg up over the boat. No! I just wet myself a little. You know, I, that kind of thing. Um, I don't know, but is that in alignment with Scripture based on what we know from other contexts and passages of Scripture? Not the wet themselves part, but the fact that they would be in the Bible, scared, or in the, in the boat, scared to death. Is that in alignment with reality of how people function and how they function? Yes, because, of course, when Jesus is carted off, they scatter. So is that in alignment? Yeah, but does the Bible say No. Now, should we make a practice to just go around and go, well, it doesn't say this, but I'm going to make some good story up. No, you've got to be careful there, too, and not take too much license there. Because I've read some books from people that love chapter 3, verse 21 and a half. 
where they just make up whatever is in the middle. I like 21, I like 22, but 21 and a half, so I'm gonna spend the next 14,000 pages telling you all about something that's just made up. You gotta be careful, okay? So we've made decisions that define us. And I'm not gonna be able to preach through all of them, um, and, but I'm gonna spend about 20 minutes and I just wanna walk you through some of these. And then I'm gonna give you an assignment at the end and your assignment is going to be to pick out the three that you like the best, and then we're going to take a break, okay? And so you can pick those three that you like the best, the ones that just really speak to you uh, as you go through. You can write on this. You can do whatever. And I want to encourage you to take it home and study it. Take it home and dig through these scriptures. Do not take my word for it. You can go read these scriptures yourself and see where we're coming from. That's important, okay? Always check what people say with scripture. So here we go. We have decided that teaching the gospel without demonstrating the gospel in love is not enough. Now, let me just stop there for a moment. We should teach the gospel. What is the gospel? Tell me real quick, out loud, nice and loud. Good news. Good news about what? Coming kingdom. Good news about life forever with Christ, with God because of what Christ does at the cross. This is good news. Problem is, good news often sounds like bad news if we're not demonstrating what that life looks like. And so you've probably been in churches or at least seen TV shows where they talk about the love of Christ while wanting to kill everyone at the, time, at the same time. Um, we have to tell the story but demonstrate the story. People need to see good news. This is why we will have a food pantry. To feed people. Will people scam us and come steal food? Yes. Does that mean we shouldn't have a food pantry? No. no. That is on them. They will answer for that someday. We will feed people. We will clothe people. We will train people in the name of Jesus. Because we're demonstrating good news. It is hard to hear Christ loves you and died for you when you are starving to death. So we are going to show it and tell it. We've decided that having a good church club is not enough. Good fellowship is not enough. Just being a member of the club is not enough. We are not a country club. Church was never intended to be. And too many churches have become that. It does not matter how you dress or how many tattoos you have <coughs> on out or how many piercings are on your skin. And that we can debate all that th theologically too if you want to. Um, and as long as you're not getting tattoos because you're a member of a cult somewhere, I think you're safe. Again, we can dig through that if you want to. Um, but... This is not a club. This is why we say we're click free. Uh, at least we strive to be. That the, all the people don't hang out in one corner because they all wear the same brand of shoes. Oh my goodness. How baloney is that? We can't do that. We're not. This is not a church club. We decided having good programs is not enough. Change without transformation is intolerable. And this thing where we are is not an option. This is that idea of we want to meet people where they are and love them too much to let them stay. Really liberal churches make a huge mistake. They will meet people where they are and then tell them you can stay there. This is not what we see in scripture. When the woman is brought to Jesus who's caught in adultery, Jesus tells her, now go and sin no more. There is an expectation of change when we come face to face with Christ. The really conservative churches make a mistake in that they won't uh, let people come until they change first. And then once they change, it can become part of the country club. Baloney. It is not possible to change outside of God. And personally, I think most of the change that occurs in us is because of community. And we come together and we hold each other's arms up when you're weak. And we hold you accountable to, you know, to live in the right life and all that stuff. It all fits together. And so we don't want to just have good programs and all that. But we also don't want to stay where we are. We want to keep growing closer to Christ, more like Him. We've decided singing songs without worshiping is empty. Worship is declaring that God is worthy. Just because we sing a song does not mean it's worship. It's only if your heart is declaring that God is worthy. That's worship, okay? Having meetings without inviting and acknowledging God's presence is pointless. God promises to be here with us when we are gathered in His name. And He's here now. But interestingly, we had a guy meandering around the parking lot earlier this week. Uh, one of the events we had and uh, a couple guys went out and talked to him and he said that he likes to come up here and wander around the parking lot because he feels the presence of God in this place that's cool that's cool now we want him to come in the building he may feel unworthy too and that's the problem because probably along the way 
other churches have made him feel unworthy. If your teeth aren't right or you've got bad clothes, you, you're not going to be welcome here. I heard that story this past Monday from someone that said they've been asked to leave three different churches because of something. And I just have to say, this is not the story of Jesus. We'll meet people where they are, but love them too much to let them stay. And that last part's important. Don't miss it. We want people to grow no matter what it is. Every one of us in this room, including me, have our own foibles and foul-ups and messes and stupid things. And most of them are secret. No one else knows. Right? We don't want to stay there. Keep growing past that. Allow God to heal those things. Invite him in to make those things right and to fix those things no matter what it is. We've decided to let the Bible be our authority and guide for life, not opinions, preferences, or creeds. People ask me all the time, well, do you believe in this creed or this creed or this creed? I dismiss all the creeds. I just go, what does the Bible say? That's what I want to see. So, and no matter what creed it is, you can make up whichever one you want. Uh, once saved, always saved. It's a creed. I just dismiss it. Let's look and see what the Bible says. Does that, does that make sense to everybody? Outward sign of an inward change. It's a creed. I dismiss it. What does the Bible say? I just want to see what scripture says and quit getting hung up in creeds that someone made up that we don't even know what it means anymore. We just have this saying that we just throw it out because it's a good dividing line to make sure you don't think what I think or whatever. Just dismiss it. What does the Bible say? It's all that's important. Uh, we've decided that reading about the book of Acts without living the book of Acts is unthinkable. I love that one. Uh, now, that would be one of mine that I would circle. It doesn't have to be one of yours. But we want to uh, not just read about it and the power of what we see happening in Acts. We want to live this out. Uh, we've decided that confident faith is good, but bold faith is better. And we'll talk about that more as we get into it. It's good to have confident faith. I am confident in my salvation. But I want to be bold in my salvation. I don't want to be confident. Confident is good, uh, but I want to be bold. I want to go out and really show the world who Jesus is. So I'm going to be bold. Um, that's important. We've decided to be a distribution center of God's blessings, not just a warehouse. There's a big difference in a warehouse and distribution center. A warehouse says we're going to store up as much stuff as we possibly can so that on a rainy day we're in good shape. A distribution center says I've got an open hand. Whatever God gives me, I'm going to distribute, and I'm going to pass it along. That doesn't mean I don't plan well and make good financial decisions and all that stuff. But it means I cannot outgive God. This church cannot outgive God. When we first moved down here, uh, you know, all I did was I was a fundraiser. You know, calling churches, calling people, asking them for money because that's what you do when you plan a church. Uh, and um, and I'll always be a fundraiser. This new building next door is just another reason to keep fundraising with my friends that have money. And, and so when, I'm sure they don't like it when I call because I don't ask them for anything else other than, hey, we've got this thing we want to do. It's going to cost 5000 What can you do? You know, <laughs> that's my typical phone call. And so, but, you know, in all of that, um, when I, I called the church, when we first moved to town, I got to know this guy up in Heber Springs. And um, they didn't want to give us any money, first of all, because we didn't have the name Christian in our name, Renew Community Church. They said, well, you must not be a, a Christian church because you don't have the word Christian there. Anyway, and so they wouldn't give us money. And then another group, they wouldn't give us money because although they had, I can't remember how much they had in the bank. I think he told me they had $60,000 in the bank, but they didn't want to give us $5,000 because someday in the future down the road. Now, this is a church of like 30 people and the average age is like 90. And so somewhere down the road, 30 years or so, they might need a new parking lot, and they're saving that money for a new parking lot. I'll tell you what, there was a moment of fire and righteous indignation in me, and it took everything to not drive to Heber and just kill them all. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it was like, are you kidding me? And so pretty much what I said to him was this, and it wasn't nice, and I'm transparent with you, I, but what I said was not particularly nice. And I, but I, here's what I said, because it really was like, we've got all this money, but we, someday we might need a new parking lot for these 30 people to come to church here. And um, even though we'll all be dead by the time we need it, but we might need it. And my response was something to the effect of, I don't want to be in your shoes when you answer for that, that you're more worried about blacktop than souls. So, see ya. <laughs> it was not nice, but it was a true statement. In my opinion. So if you think I'm mean, then I love you anyway. So there you go. Um, we did just fine. We did just fine without their money. 
So uh, because God has all of it, and he can provide it however he wants to. Uh, let's see. We have decided to be Holy Spirit filled, led, and empowered. Anything less doesn't work for us. Well, that is a big challenge um, to not allow the Holy Spirit to work. One of the things that um, I have gotten in the habit of with, with uh, several, that when we get together and we plan things and we develop ideas for where we're going and what we need to do, and even a sermon topic or whatever, one of the things that, um, that we have started doing, and it came out of me quite by accident, I was literally praying out loud with one other person. We were about to plan and work on a project. And it came out of my mouth. And I said, God, I surrender my intelligence to you. I surrender my education to you. I surrender my ability to get things done to you. Because I know yours is still better. I need you. I need your smarts, your intelligence, not mine. And it came out of my mouth and I didn't plan to. So that's when the Holy Spirit's working and things come out. And, and at the end, when we finished up the prayer and we kind of had to process through that. Like, what did I just say? Uh, but it was so important. Because if you know you're smart, and that's not a, that's not a pride thing, prideful thing. If you know you're smart, you can get things done. How often can we just push through and just get things done on our own? And that happens in church all the time. If you have smart people around, and in this room, we've got a lot of smart people. Uh, we, could, we could just get, you know what, if we really had 65 or 70 people who were totally committed to a project, we could not worry about God one time, and we could accomplish a lot. You know what I'm saying? We don't want to do that. We want God's very best. I want God's very best. I want God's wisdom. The seminary degree matters very, very little. Uh, if we don't invite God's presence and God to move in us and teach us and to comfort us and to grow us and to lead us. We need God to do that, uh, and that's important. Okay, let's see. We've decided to be the ones telling the stories of God's power, not ones only hearing about them. We've decided living saved but not supernatural is not living at all, short of what Christ died for. Again, that's kind of a saved life versus supernatural. Supernatural means... I know God is at work and can do bigger things. This is part of why I talk about being amazed, not surprised. We decided that we're a battleship, not a cruise ship. Army, not an audience. Special forces, not spectators. Missionaries, not club members. We decided to be radical lovers and outrageous givers. We decided that we're a mission station, not a museum. Uh, I preached on that not too long ago, a few months ago. And the idea was... Um, this building is not the church. You are the church. We are the church. This building can burn down tomorrow, and the church does not um, get damaged whatsoever. It's just a building. So what we choose to use this building for is a mission station, not a museum. A museum has very nice, pretty things uh, that are just pretty to look at, but not touch. This is not that. If a kid comes in here in the summer program throws some toy across the room and puts a hole in the wall, it is not the end of the world. We will not kill this child for it. We will fix the hole, and we will remember God's grace. Instead of damaging that child so bad that they never want to have anything to do with God. And that can happen, and it happens all the time. It was funny, after I preached on that message, um, apparently... The uh, Awana group was talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace out in the lobby and caught the floor on fire. That's the story. It was right after I preached on this. Uh, and I'm pretty sure there's still a dark mark where that fire occurred on the floor. But it was an instant reminder that this is why we don't have carpet. Uh, and, and guess what? These concrete floors, they can be ugly, but this is sort of a picture of our life. We've got stains and mess and here and there, but we still worship. And God is still good. And God is still on his throne. It just doesn't matter. you know. And that's why we're a mission station. It's much easier to have these floors. Now, someday we might stain them. If, you know, But it's a mission station. It's going to get messy. It just doesn't matter. Now, I'm not beating up any churches that have steeples or stained glass. They can do that if they feel that's right for them. Uh, we're not going to have those. Sorry. We're never going to have a steeple or stained glass here. Why? Because there are too many hungry people. It was funny, when we moved to this building, though, I no kidding, when I would meet people out in town, they would find out we were buying this building. They'd go, so are you going to put a steeple on there? It was hard for me not to go, no. <laughs> um, 
But I would just go, no, because we have GPS. You don't need a steeple to find the church anymore. And so that's pretty much the answer. We decided to meet people where they are, but love them too much to let them stay there. We talked about that. We decided to be click free, a hospital from Soul Sick, colorblind, and a place for second chances. Colorblind is going to be a big deal in Cabot, Arkansas. Uh, that is a hard one. And we're going to work on it and help us understand that there are going to be all nations and tribes and tongues, all colors in heaven. And um, maybe it's our job here at Renew, and I don't know where all you are on that topic, because we're, because um, Cabot has always been known as a white flight town. We're just going to say it the way it is. It's in leadership training. It's always been a white flight town. And I think um, it's challenging because even the churches have that problem. And I think maybe part of our mission at Renew is to overcome that and uh, to create an environment where uh, we can look past that color. And it doesn't matter. We worship the same Savior. So hopefully that will be a mission of ours, a place for second chances. Anyone else in here need a second chance from time to time? Okay. I need a second chance on my second chance. We've decided to welcome people with tattoos or not, piercings or not, suits or shorts, fat or thin, young or old, rich or poor. Again, the outside shell does not matter. Uh, God is interested in your heart. We have decided that it is better to fail while reaching for the impossible that God has planned for us than to succeed settling for less. I've had people ask me, as a new church, being around two and a half years, aren't you worried about taking on a 70,000 plus square foot building and all that and blah, 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 blah. My answer is I am not afraid because I know that God is in this. However, should we fail? We fail. It is not the end of the world. It is just what it, how it goes. If you look through scripture, what you find is a BBYSS model, which is but because you said so. It did not always go well for the disciples. Paul would be a great example. We can go do a little survey of his life. Was Paul listening to God? I, I think so. Was Paul being driven by the Holy Spirit? I think so. Was Paul being driven by love for Christ? I think so. Uh, was he out doing good things and sharing good news with people? I think so. Was Paul's life easy? No, it was hell. I mean, it was bad. This guy is being beaten and stoned and shipwrecked, left for dead, bitten by snakes, all kinds of things. But because you said so, I'll do this. This is the story of discipleship. It's part of taking up your cross and following. It will not always be smooth. And you've got to understand as leaders and as future leaders that are growing in this, you're going to come under attack. You just will. Uh, you're going to have a hard time. You're going to have people say stupid things to you and make you want to run away. Don't. But because you said so, I will do this. Don't allow the devil to win. Submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. Um, this is important. This is important. It will not always go well. Will, is it possible to fail? Yes. Will we move on? You betcha. So am I scared about taking the building? No. Now, does it mean you don't go count the cost? No, it doesn't mean that. You should count the cost and be intelligent. But the truth is, I want to do things here that prove that it is not just Spencer's best idea. I want to be willing to say, God, if you will lead us to it, even if it does not make human sense, we will be obedient. Even if that means we fail. Even if. Because we don't always win in this life. Make sense? All right. <clears throat> We've decided to be disciples, making disciples, baptizing disciples, and continuing to teach disciples to obey Jesus. Uh, great commission. Make disciples, an apprentice. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then teach them to obey everything Jesus taught and said. Part of what we're doing is this. In case you didn't get that, Part of the underlying concept, and I'll be transparent about it, in leadership training is to take 60, 65, 70 people and pour into them to teach them how to obey Jesus and then go become disciple makers and do the same for others. This is a game changer right here um, where you have all these people that are wanting to grow in Christ and develop as leaders really ultimately being disciple making disciples to be a discipler. It's a game changer. This is unusual to get a church our size. Now, we're not a small church anymore, but to get this many people in a room who want to 
grow and become leaders if you will do this and become disciples and disciples making disciples it will literally change this town and this county and maybe the state it will change dramatically but again the devil hates it so you're gonna have to push back uh, but God will fight that battle so you have to let him do it okay we've decided that and all we do is for the glory of God's name not our own we get written up in the newspaper a lot I don't know if you know that or not. We've gotten on the news many times. It's like there's this little magnet. When we go out and do stuff, um, the news crews are there, and they want to talk to me or talk to us. They want to write newspaper articles about us, um, all that good stuff. And it would be so easy to get hung up there in pride because that is one of the devil's primary weapons, especially for church leaders. Look at how awesome you are. We must deflect that back to God constantly. Mm -hmm. And I promise you, you guys, if you step out and you're leading, people will come along and go, you are awesome. You are great. You do such good things. And something deep down inside of us will want to go, thank you. I am awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but instead to deflect it and go, you know, we're just being obedient. I was down at Kroger buying um, a, a gasoline card uh, a couple days ago. And the lady behind the desk I could read it in her body language that she was hurting. And God prompted me to say to her, so what happened today that messed everything up for you? And I said something to that effect. And she looked at me and she basically said, do I know you? And I went, nope. And she said, I am having a terrible day. She said, did you hear the conversation? She's trying to figure out what's going on. She said, did you hear the conversation I was having with my manager there when you walked up? And I went, nope, I'm half deaf. I didn't hear her thing. <laughs> and she said, it's a bad day. And I said, okay, so um, I'm going to pray for you. Do you believe that that's a good thing? And she said, you're going to make me cry right now. And I went, well, that's okay if you want to do that. But mm -hmm. she said, but how did you know? I said, well, God prompted me to ask. I said, um, it was just the right moment. And then we begin this dialogue over the counter about God and his goodness. And uh, ultimately, you know, she's like, you know, you're amazing. And I went, not at all. I'm just obedient. Or I'm trying to be. Because I'm not always obedient. I mean, that whole thing, like, I joke about it a lot. You know, I want to run them off the road in my car. And all. It really is a joke. 99%. I don't want to lie on top of it. You know, I'm not always perfectly obedient. I'm a work in progress. Does that hopefully that doesn't freak you out too bad? I'm a work in progress, just like you are. Jennifer can, uh, you know, affirm that this is true. I'm a work in progress. I said, no, I'm just trying to be obedient to what God prompted me to do with you. And um, and so she laid it out, and we and I prayed for her, and that's good. To be in that moment um, to deflect it back to God. Now, this is a this is God's story. This is not Spencer Dunlap being awesome. This is God's story. We proclaim His name because I don't want her to worship me. She's got to go back and see this was God. It does not matter if she remembers my name or who I am or my face or any of that stuff. She needs to see God was at work here, and I am thankful. One other story, and I gotta, I'll gotta. i finish this up, and let's take a break. Um, I told this story this week to um, a friend, to Jackie. We had lunch together, and uh, I told him the story. And um, often, but not always, if I feel prompting like to a waitress or something at a, at a uh, restaurant, I don't do it just for, I don't do it just to do it. But if God prompts me to um, engage with a waitress or a waiter, um, and say, you know, something to the effect of, you know, Mike, we're going to pray over this meal in a minute. Can I pray for you? And uh, or is there anything we can pray for you about? And, and have had varying levels of success with that. We've had some really interesting stories come out over the years, like the time that uh, we said that we were in Florida and uh, uh, did that. What another guy we were with uh, offered that to a, a gal who immediately became enraged, basically, that we offered to pray for her and told us we could pray for her cat. And stormed off. 
Um, but guess what? We did pray for her cat. <laughs> we did. Um, and it was kind of funny. It's like, God, never prayed for a cat before. But she asked us to pray for a cat. So, so. we're praying for a cat. Uh, even though all cats should die. But no, I'm just kidding. And so, uh, so we're praying. And, uh, but I felt compelled the whole time. This isn't actually a story I'm going to tell you, but it's a good story. So I felt compelled to go back. Before we left town, Jennifer and I go back. We ask for her and to sit at her table. And she comes up, oh, hi, guys. And she was nice again. You know, she got over the anger of us asking to pray for her. And so the first word, it was total boldness and a little, a little scary. But I looked at her in the face and went, so how's your cat? <laughs> and it was amazing. Jennifer, do you remember that story? And she goes, uh, well, she said, you know, that night I went home and the cat for the first time in forever, like jumped up on my lap spent time with me and it didn't before and didn't pee on anything in the house because that was the problem and I said to her have you considered that that was God at work because we prayed for that she went yeah I said is there a time you would let me tell you about Jesus and she said yeah I'd like that and we talk on Facebook still and that was three four years ago and slow process Man. The story I was going to tell you was with my, my Hannah. Now, is that a good me story? No. That is God doing amazing things, even in a cat. <laughs> <laughs> the story that I want to tell you, and we'll finish up with this, is... Um, so I've done that several times. Kids had seen that. And again, not a good me thing, but um, we're at a catfish restaurant in Kansas City. This was years ago. And the um, waiter, waitress comes up, takes a drink order or whatever. And leaves. And Hannah goes, um, so are you going to do that thing you do? And I went, no, no, I don't think so. I don't feel like uh, that's what I'm supposed to do. I said, but, you know, it, do you or if you? Well, yeah. And so, you know, she felt like she should. And she thought that we should engage her. And I said, well, Hannah, if you feel like you need to offer to pray for her, you should do that. And she's just freaked out. I'm like, well, what would I say? And I was like, well, you apparently have heard me do it a few times. You know, just offer to pray for her, whatever. <laughs> And so the lady comes back, and Hannah kind of, you know, at this time, I don't know, how long ago? Eight, probably. Probably eight, maybe. And Hannah looks up at this lady, and she goes, you know, we were something to the effect of, you know, we're a praying family, we're going to pray over a meal. Is there anything I can pray for you about? And this lady just explodes in uh, emotion and starts weeping at our table and then runs <laughs> the other way. <laughs> And Hannah's like, <gasps> what did I do? And I was like, you're okay, you're okay, you're okay. You didn't do anything wrong, you're okay. We'll figure it out, it's all right. You know, Hannah's first experience to offer to pray for someone in a restaurant, and the lady freaks out and, and sprints the other direction. And I'd never had that happen before. So after a while, she comes back, and you could tell she'd just been bawling her eyes out. And she apologizes, and she says, I hope I can say this, and she says, I, was, I had just been in the kitchen praying and asking God if he still loved me. Um, and that little girl showed me that he does. So these are these, this is what this is about, guys. I mean, it's not just about what we pull off on a Sunday morning. Oh, we do a good job with that, I think. And do we do it perfect? No way. Will we ever? Probably not. And that's okay. This is about disciples making disciples and sharing the love of Christ and reverting people back to God and His glory, not ours. That story, she may remember that for the rest of her life. I hope we see her in heaven. And she'll run up and go, I was that one that, you're, that you, Hannah, prayed for in that restaurant. I was that one. Oh. Won't that be amazing to see that and to hear that story? I want that story. Uh, salvation hangs in the balance. And not just for the people that show up here on Sunday morning. Salvation hangs in the balance. So we've decided that we're not limited by four walls of a building. And our influence is not restricted to one location. The people are the church. And we're a church in motion. Which means that when you go to lunch today, you are the church. When you go to work Monday in school, you're the church. And people are broken and hurting everywhere. And they need you 
to show them who God is. Yeah. He loves them. He has not forgotten them. And um, I do think you have the freedom to remind people of that anytime you want. Absolutely. We've decided we will not be satisfied until our world cries out. Those who have turned the world upside down have come here too. What decisions define you? So I'm going to give you a 10-minute break. And um, what I'd like for you to do is circle the three that really, really touch you. And then we'll give it a little opportunity to share in a few minutes. Look at your watches. It's 9.49. We will start at 9.59. We will. Don't be late. Talking about the top three for individuals and seeing if there's consensus at your table in any way. <laughs>
So keep digging through them, discuss those, and find consensus. see if there's any consensus uh, at your table. So did any of our tables have a consensus on any one of those things? One. Okay. If you did, raise your hand. I want to hear what they are. Okay, back here. Okay, quiet everybody. Hang on. Hey. We're not going to be able to hear if we don't have mic because the heater's running. Yes. Back the first one. The very yes. first one. Yes. Okay. That was a consensus view. Yes. Well, on the group, I put mine away, unfortunately. So, okay. The first one. We decided teaching the gospel without demonstrating the gospel and love is not enough. How many of you in the room had that on your top three that you circled? Okay. Very good. So, that's awesome. You guys had a consensus view back there. What else? What other table had at least some consensus? Yes. We had a... Uh... We have decided to be Holy Spirit filled, led, and empowered, anything less than work for us. Okay, Holy Spirit filled, led, and empowered, anything less than work for us. Very good. How many of you in the room have that as one of your top three? All right, very good. All right, Melissa, you guys, you had some consensus? We have decided to welcome people with tattoos or not, piercings or not, suits or shorts, battle kids, and the other old support. Okay. Be people with tattoos or not, piercings or not, suits or shorts, fat or thin, young or old, rich or poor. How many of you in the room had that as one of your top three? Okay, very good. All right, any other tables have a consensus view on at least one? You circled the whole thing. You circled the whole thing, okay. <laughs> but one of the questions that was asked to me in this was, is there one of these that all of them are sort of wrapped up in? Um, do you have the answer for that? Yeah. Okay, which, what is it? We have decided to let the Bible be our authority and God for life, not opinions, purposes, and dreams. I agree. And that was my answer, too. Good job. That if we allow the authority to be our guide, all of this comes out of Scripture. These are all <laughs> practical concepts that come out of believing the Bible is true. 
And this is the story that we pick up. When you begin to learn about the heart of Jesus, this is what you see. This is what you see in here. So I agree. All right. Anyone else have a consensus? I don't need to until the last one comes up. I see you all the rest of these. Okay, so what Dave said was for that idea of are all, is there anywhere or any one of these that wraps the whole thing together? We said the Bible being our guide was one. And the last one we've decided will not be satisfied until the whole world cries out. Those who have turned the world upside down have come here too. I agree. Because if the church, universal, will do these things, the whole world would cry out. They would. The church has overall has uh, failed, unfortunately, in so many of these areas. Uh, and uh, if we could get back to it, um, we would see many come to know the Lord. Yeah? Wouldn't it be cool if that's what they started saying about us? These people who have turned habit upside down. Yeah. Especially as we go out and plant other churches someday, <laughs> which is part of who we are and who we will be. Um, that would be an awesome message. And the reason to go plant is... Those who have turned cabin upside down have come here too, and they're uh, they're about to do that here. That would be cool. Now that would be a church planting movement that would be exciting. If that the whole thrust of it was, those who have turned that community upside down have come here too. Guess what's about to go down? That would be awesome. All right. One more. Any uh, any other consensus? Yeah, Jennifer. We're not limited by these four walls. Let that be a message on our lips forever, please. One of the challenges with um, churches is they, they begin, they're new, they're exciting, they're growing. And then over time, what happens is they stop doing the things that they did to be new. Oh, you, you are awesome. Uh, and they stop doing the thing. That we're doing exciting and, and stop focusing on reaching out and begin to become inwardly focused and everything we do is for ourselves we cannot do that we must not do that i had people say to me well if you go and buy a building you guys are going to stop being outreach focused and you're just going to worry about yourselves and your building and my answer was we refuse refuse to do that we cannot get stuck there. We have to be focused on getting outside the walls. Because, um, I don't know if you've heard this before, but movies have some bad theology in them. And um, the movie about uh, if we build it, they will come, that idea, it is not true for churches. Now, if you build a big super megaplex and it's gorgeous, will people come? Yeah. But unfortunately, not usually for the right reason. If they come because... It's attractional. Should the church be attractional? Should they come here and want to be here? Absolutely. But if there's no substance on the inside, all we're doing is having a party. Uh, and so you have to be attractional and missional and incarnational, all those words. So attractional is there's something to come here for. Missional is we're on a mission to go out because salvation hangs in the balance. Uh, and um, that whole build it, they will come. Although people will come here because the building is cool or nice or big or different or whatever, the church has to still go out to the lost folks. And we've got to go out and be among them. This is what Jesus did. Jesus did not set up a camp at the temple and hang out there all the time. Jesus was out walking the streets in the muck, being among the people. And the church has to be an apprentice of Jesus. That's part of what we do and get out of these walls and not get stuck inside and so missional uh, attractional and incarnational you are not Jesus and that's all one of those things that a lot of uh, uh, especially in contemporary culture you'll hear and there are movie clips and I actually watched one this week trying to find the right video for um, for Easter and stuff like that and it was you are Jesus <coughs> And I get the idea of you are Jesus to the world, but you're not Jesus. And you, here's the thing, though. You reflect him because you're his kid, made in his image. But you are not Jesus. I am not Jesus. Uh, but you can represent him because part of the call to you as a Christian um, is 
to be his ambassador and to point people back to him. And then when you look in a mirror, you reflect him because you're his kid. Just like you might look like your biological parents in some way or act like them. Um, we want to be this way. That you yourself are not Jesus, but we can be like Jesus to a lost, hurting, broken, dying world. And we must. We must. They will never see us if we only let them see it when we're inside this building. Because a lot of people, I hate to tell you this, a lot of people are scared of the church. Um, one thing about that, and I'm going to wrap my part up, and I'm going to invite Travis and Kirk up here to jump in. But one of the things that I wrote in the cover of my Bible, so I have all kinds of interesting things written down here. But in the cover of my Bible, before we planted here at Renew, I was praying and spending time with God and trying to figure out what He wanted us to do and who He wanted us to be. And one of the things I wrote down, because I heard very clearly from the Lord, was people can hear God calling. And they want to come, but they're so afraid of the church. People are afraid of the church. People are afraid to come here. Um, and we need to let them see the love uh, and the strength um, as we go out in our normal day-to-day -day things. And then um, it won't be so scary when they come here. Does that make sense? Unfortunately, one of the things I said a lot in the very beginning at Renew was, we're not starting at zero. We're starting at like negative 18. Because there's so many people, and many of you are in this room right now, had bad experiences and you had given up on church. Uh, or given up on Christians or given up on pastors because of bad experiences. And so you're not starting at zero with people that have had bad experiences. You're starting at negative 18. And you have to overcome that. God will overcome that. Um, but it's work. It's work. Um, and, uh, but it's a labor of love if we have the right heart toward people that are broken. And so, um, so that's my encouragement. So, my, my hope is that you will dig through those decisions at finest. You'll be challenged by them. I hope what you will see in that is rationale for why we do the things we do here. Uh, hopefully, as you look through it, you go, I get that. That's why we say the things we say. That's why we do the things we do. That makes sense. Um, because we don't create stuff to do just to be busy. Uh, we really don't. Because we're all busy enough. We do things to make real impacts in people's lives. Even if that means just having fun, like last night. To have a movie night. Is it okay for us to have fun together? Yes, because God gave us laughter for a reason. Um, and we do. if we're really a church that's about doing life together, being an Acts-style church where we meet together and we fellowship and we eat together and spend time together, sitting down and enjoying time like that is important. It's important. And so, um, so hopefully that'll make sense to you.